Please join me in welcoming Grant Gidner. Thank you so much. Hello. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I, um, I was telling Jamie earlier that I'm at, the, I'm at the tail end of a book tour right now, and I was saying if, if this had been my first event, the rest of the events would have been screwed because they would have had to live up to this. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. Um, so thank you to, to Branch Mirage Library for having me and Jamie for having me and the, the program directors. This is, this is such a dream. Um, so yeah, I thought I would talk a little bit about my new book. I'm gonna read for, for just a few minutes because I know that that often like induces napping reading. Um, and then I'm excited to jump into conversation with, uh, with Koi. So, so my new book is uh, Let's Not Do That Again. And by, by way of a, a quick summary, it follows the last chaotic month of a, a congresswoman, a New York congresswoman's campaign for Senate. And in addition to all the, the normal political chaos that she's facing, the, the stakes of her campaign suddenly become higher when, when a video emerges of her wayward daughter throwing a champagne bottle through the window of a very famous Parisian bistro. So that, that, that sends her, as you might imagine, sends her campaign into this sort of this, this downward spiral. So to that end, it's, um, it's a novel that's as much about family dysfunction as it is about political dysfunction and particularly what happens when the two come together. So I'm gonna read from the very beginning of the book, so it doesn't need that much of an introduction, but um, you'll, I think you'll, you'll, you'll figure out pretty quickly what's going on. So this is the prologue titled, Give Me a Smile. The champagne has gone to her head. Also, there's the problem of the smoke. It's everywhere. The smell of burning wood and plastic assaulting her nostrils, the crisp, crisp static of smoldering embers. It's raining, but that hardly helps. Fires spill from the storefronts along the avenue, flames outside of Bulgari, singed mannequins at Hugo Boss and Lacoste. A bank with smashed windows turned into an open air theater, shirts with their tags still on them strewn across the streets. She finds herself part of an organized and slow moving chaos. Protesters creep up the Champs Elysees, their jackets slick with rain until the police, feeling as if they've been too generous, force them to relinquish ground. This is how it works, how it surges, two steps forward, one step back. The sea as the tide rises, climbing over shells on a long stretch of beach. Some of them wear gas masks that make them appear alien, insectile, and those who do not wrap their faces with handkerchiefs and scarves. A strip of wool bearing the logo of Paris Saint-Germain, or in her case, a square of silk from Hermès. Often, she sees the marchers, patriots to some, terrorists to others, stop to take selfies. Here we are, and here France burns, their smiles say, and when they're finished, they march on. They dodge giant hoses and sing. They balance their lit cigarettes behind their ears so they can use both their fists. They inch closer to the Arc de Triomphe, and from behind police barricades, tear, ga tear gas cannons pop like so many corks. The mob's anatomy is the structure of an atom. At the center is a tight nucleus around which orbits a wild tangle of electrons. She is one of those orb orbiters. She could be 18, but she could also be 30. Smo the smoke smudges out her years, adding lines where there shouldn't be lines while stealing others away. She wears a black Chanel dress and a pair of Adidas sneakers, and in her right hand, she holds a half-full bottle of champagne. Beneath her silk scarf, she's smiling, but it's a different smile from others. Hers is not wild and tenacious, but rather curious, the mild surprise of someone who's just woken up from a long summer nap. She, need, uh, she reads some of the signs around her and joins in some of the chants, but after a few minutes, she gets restless, bored. She takes another swig of the champagne and drifts farther away. Two people follow her, the first, a camera operator from a French news station, the second, a handsome man with full brown hair. They track her as she crosses Avenue Georges Sank and stops, finally, beneath the blood-red awnings of Fouquet's. The girl looks at the man with the camera, then up at the iconic restaurant. This, she seems to be saying, is the spot. Bits of marble lie at her feet, the detritus of a facade that used to stand here or on the Grand Boulevards, scabs picked from the face of Paris. She crouches down to touch them, and for a pure crystalline instant, the, sound of the, avenue, the sounds of the avenue quiet and the world calms. Here is a girl, her hair in her face. Glass shatters, a waiter screams. 
Her hands now freed, the girl searches her pockets for a cigarette. The camera coaxes her into focus, and beside it, the handsome man laughs. Greta, he shouts, give me a smile. At first, the man with the camera worries that his friend has made a mistake. The girl stares at them blankly, her eyes wide and green and full. But a moment later, aha, there it is. The devilish curl of her lips, the glint of her perfect American teeth. Thank you. <laughs> It's so cozy up here. <laughs> Hi. So welcome back to uh, Southern California. Jeff. Thank you. Thank and you. You know, it was, it was hilarious. I, I flew originally into San Diego, and I was taking a, a cab from the airport to the hotel I was staying in in La Jolla. And I haven't been back to California in years. And even like pulling on to the five, I like almost broke into tears. I was just <laughs> so, it, it was like crazy. I was like so excited to be back on the five, you know? It was nuts. So you grew up in Laguna, but I this, did. this is not your first time in the desert. You kind of had uh, no, some roots I, my, here. So my, my grandmother had a condo over in Palm Desert um, that we would go to all of the time growing up, you know, for, for, for Christmas and Thanksgiving and New and, and, and Easter, like all holidays. And so I have, I have really fond memories in of fact, being out in the desert. Grant said that this library is where he first discovered his love for literature. Yeah, that's right. So I do a little fiction too. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> like we can all make up yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, we can all make right. up things, right? So, <laughs> but then you left and went to UPenn, East Coast. I did. Ivy League school. But you didn't study writing. No, I didn't. I actually, I studied political science. Um, I took, I, I, I only took one writing class in college. I was always very involved in writing, and I, I, I loved writing growing up, and I, I, I loved reading, particularly reading fiction growing up. But in, in college, I studied politics, and I, I ended up, after graduating from the University of Pennsylvania, I went to, to Washington, where I worked as a speechwriter for John Podesta. Um, and so, so still definitely writing, but, um, but it's funny. I, mean, I, I actually credit... This is going to sound really bad. I, I credit speech writing for making me a fiction writer. Um, I, I, speaking of making stuff yeah, up. Yeah, speaking of making stuff up, right? No, no. I, I think that, I think, <laughs> it sounds terrible. I'm sorry, John. Um, no, I, I, I um, what I mean by that is I, I think I learned when I was writing speeches that that the best speeches tell stories, right? And the best way of changing a mind, of persuading someone of something, of, of making an argument often is with a story. There are, there are narrative arcs to speeches, the best speeches. Yeah. And so I, I, I really learned what those arcs, I think, looked like while I was writing speeches. Um, and so, so when I went to eventually try my hand at fiction um, and, and later went on to get my MFA in New York, I, I, I still think that speech writing set me up for that, you know, that perhaps even better than my MFA did. Also, you, you have deadlines for speech writing, right? Exactly. Oh, yes. I mean, the, the, the second thing that I think speech writing really taught me was a sense of discipline when it came to writing. You know, I, I was constantly on deadline um, when I was writing speeches. And so I look at my fiction writing in very much the same way. I, you know, I, I get up early in the morning, I walk the dog, and then I sit down at my desk, and I'm, I'm working by 8.30. Um, yeah. You know, I have other particularly novelist friends who are writing at, like, the craziest hours, right? I mean, when but you it, just had, like, to pack your lunch pail and... I, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, you got to get the words done. The uh, you got to get the words written, the work done. And and for me, I just I learned from speech writing that you just sit down and do but it. But you weren't just writing speeches, and you, you you came out with your first novel. What you were twenty six years old, and while you were I was, which which yeah. I want to I want to stress that that I wrote that novel when I was twenty four, which is an age at which no one should be writing a novel. Um, and when you read that novel, you'll see that. And so, <laughs> Actually, no one read that novel. But it's got a prophetic title. It, it, the title of that novel is this about it. I mean, I knew from, from reading, but I didn't know where to start. And so the first thing I did was literally Google how many words are in a novel. Uh, my entire <laughs> writing process for the first novel was just an advertisement for Google. It, and so I Googled, and it was like, oh, 80,000 words. And I was like, okay, okay, I can do 80,000 words. <laughs> and so I set about writing 80,000 words. And when the 80,000 words were done, I was like, typed in and, you know, how to publish a novel. And then it was like, well, you have to get a literary agent. How to find a literary agent. And so I, uh, it was, you know, and, and I, uh, I ended up just kind of essentially sending query letters, which is the equivalent of cold calling these literary agents. And, um, 
I ended up with one who I'm, I'm still with to this day, who's wonderful. Um, but but yeah, I, I was writing that first novel when I was featuring. So that came out, uh, I think, 2009. I it think. did, it, it did. And now we're 2022, and you're on your fifth novel. I, I know that I just keep fooling them into giving yeah. me money for these Amazing. things, right? Anyway. <laughs> so I think in your first novel published when you're 26, I'm calling my kids and saying, you know, you need to, uh, there's a clock ticking here. Well, it's so. really, it's, it's, it was very funny. I, I still remember at my at the my for that first novel my my parents and were still living in Laguna at the time and they they had a book party for me which was really lovely and they're they're wonderful people and my dad came up you know stood up to give a toast and he was like you know Grant told us he was going to write a novel and we were like all right <laughs> and then he did it and then for the second novel he was like you know we couldn't believe he did it the first time. <laughs> and then he's got another one. It was my dad, it was like this look of like pride, but also like, what? You know, it's so mm -hmm. odd. It was, it was funny, it was funny. So, but this one now, it's getting like so much um, praise and so it must be really you. fun. And I think one of the common things that I hear is everybody says it's a fun read, right? I mean, that's like the thing. Everybody says it's a fun read. Was it as much fun to write? So, um, I, you know, I mean, it was very fun to write. You know, writing is, it's, it's, it's alternating between like being, being in, in a wonderful process and like a miserable process. Like whenever I have a student that's like, I want to write a book. I'm like, okay, my first advice is don't. Um, no, I'm kidding. But uh, it was fun to write. It, um, it, 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 I'm very flattered when people say that it's a fun read. When I set out to write it, that was my main goal. I wanted to write something yeah. that was just a really fun story, that you were invested in the characters and you were involved with them, um, particularly because I, I started writing it in 2018 when I felt like our, our democracy was sort of under attack, you know, from left, right, and center. And so, so the, the novel deals with some of these political issues, but, and then I, as the pandemic hit, I was still writing it and in, in, in the first draft, and so it did become this escape for me. Um, particularly in 2020 when, you know, we were kind of locked down in New York and um, it was a way of sort of living in the world again, is, yeah. you know, even though it was between the covers, you know, of this book. But um, in so, so to that end, the process was, was very fun um, and, and certainly an escape at a time when I, I felt like, you know, we're still kind of living in it, this, this, this very, very dire, very tense time. It, the novel was an escape for me. One of the things that's fun when you read it is that you got to pay attention because stuff <laughs> comes back, right? Yeah, and it's, it I mean, does. You've, you know, people have heard of Chekhov's gun. Well, Chekhov's trash compactor. <laughs> it, I, I don't want to give things away. away but... We won't give away. <laughs> but right, so, so the Chekhov's gun principle is, is, you know, Chekhov has this quote that I'm going to butcher, but essentially if there's, if there's a rifle hanging on the wall in the first act, it has to go off in the second or the third. And so essentially details matter, right? And that, that you can't overload your reader with these inconsequential details. When I was writing this novel in its very early stages, I was also randomly just reading a ton of Agatha Christie. I'm not like a mystery reader, but I, I don't know. I, it was, a, you know, I, in the first draft, like I said, it was during the pandemic. I just wanted an escape. I just wanted things that were fun to read. And what I found in reading those novels was there was so much pleasure in seeing an inconsequential detail suddenly become consequential. And something that you came across earlier in the novel changed the course of the rest of the plot later on. And so I wanted to play with that. I've never, there's, the, the book kind of bends genre a little bit. There's some, some like thrill, light thriller elements to it, light mystery elements to it. And that was, I think, my way of, of playing with that genre. I, I typically don't write in that space, but for this book in particular, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to be able to replicate that, that pleasure. And it's fun, too, because as a reader, when you see things that are foreshadowing, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I, yeah. I, I wish, like, the... I wish the Cone Brothers had, yeah. <laughs> had put like a wood chipper in the beginning of Fargo, right, just so you right. know, get ready for this. Right, but, right, get uh, ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, You're going to see this wood chipper again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it Not been the way that you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was, um, so it's kind of fun seeing that. When, now, the reviews have been really good. Do you, I mean, the cool thing as an author is saying, I don't care about the reviews. Right, is that right. True? That's oh my not true, God, is that's it? such a lie. <laughs> that is such a lie. Whenever, whenever an author tells you, like, oh, I don't, get, I don't read my reviews, I'm like, uh huh, okay, sure, <laughs> right? No, of course. I mean, there, are, um, I, I feel uh, very lucky, and there have been some very generous reviews, um, which, which 
have, have been very kind. Um, but you know, it's 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 you. It, it's really nerve wracking. I mean, the, the Times, the New York Times reviewed it last week, and. I yeah. thought the review was coming out the week before. Like you never know when they're coming out, right? It's, 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 it, they, they like tell you like, it's getting reviewed, but they don't tell you who's reviewing it and they don't tell you when it's coming out. So you're just like basically just waiting, you know, with bated breath. And I, the, the, so the week that I thought it was coming out, um, I'm, I'm such a like neurotic mess that I, I like every night I would probably sleep like two or three hours and I would just stare at the ceiling thinking of like all of the bad things, the New York, like I was writing the bad review for my book and I was, I was so convinced that, that, that those, these were the things that they were going to say that, that when this positive review came out, I actually had to read it like four or five times to believe it. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 that's not what it's supposed to say. It's supposed to say all these terrible things, right? And so, uh, but, but I, I've, been, I've been very fortunate. But we're in this funny world now where you have professional reviews. Oh, and then the... And then you got all the Amazon Goodreads. Right. Do you read those reviews too? Right. You know, I, like for laughs, I think, once in a while. But that actually, you know, I, I, I say that, but there are occasionally like, you know, I'll check in on Goodreads every once in a while, but I'm, I... Everyone likes to make fun of Goodreads, uh, or authors do, but I'm often very surprised by the intelligence of the, not all the reviews on Goodreads, <laughs> but like, but the intelligence of the reviews, how careful of readers people are that are on Goodreads. Um, they're, they're often like very, you know, in, in, in very, I, you know, I'll get critiqued for things that I'm like, well, that's a valid, that's, when I read, I'm like, that's a valid critique, you know? Um, yeah. And so I don't look at Goodreads that much, but. I think I have a, a, a slightly better opinion of it than some of my colleagues that just look at it as this like, you know, trash fire where your ego is just going to be destroyed. <laughs> so. do, you, do you people write reviews for, do people, can put your hand up, you write reviews for Amazon or Goodreads, so? Uh, yeah, I think know? that they're, I, yeah. please do. Um, I think, I, no, I'm serious, I'm serious. I think that um, as, as readers, you have a, every right to engage with the work in a public setting. The, 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 the work is out there and it's your, you know, it's, it's it's for you to consume. So. so when you, as an author, you read these reviews, whether it's negative, if it's a negative review, but especially if it's a positive review, how does that then influence your future work? It's a great question. It's a great question. I think that, that there's, right, there's dangers of reviews if the review is bad, and then also, but obviously, if the review is good, because, you know, I, I read this, this New York Times review that calls this, you know, a, a caper about urban elites, and... And the next book I'm writing takes place in the 1990s in Laguna Beach and is told from the point of view of a 15-year-old boy, which is like not an urban caper with elites, right? And so it's very different. So you can, you know, for you, it's very easy to get into your own head and say, well, should I just try to replicate this Success. thing that I've already written because yeah. they seem to have liked that, which um, I think is a very easy trap to fall into. But... Um, it, you know, I'm more interested, I think, in trying new things and growing as a writer and, and, and in trying different formats and forms and perspectives. And so uh, you kind of, you have to shut that out as well, the good stuff and the bad stuff. You, you do that in this book a little bit. You kind of played with, I mean, uh, most of your books, I think you enjoy having multiple perspectives, That's right? right. That's but right. But here you did something different with one of the characters. Right. So the, it, yeah. The, the, yeah, so this book is told in five acts. Um, and the four of the five acts are told in that the perspective is close third person, right? So you're he, she, and everything, but and you're very close to one character. And I traditionally write books in that, in that way. I like alternating, kind of jumping around between characters. I, th I like trying to see how ca two characters would think about and process and experience the same event in different ways. But there's one section in this book, the second section is told entirely in first person from Greta's points of view. Greta, Greta is the, the, the young woman who throws the champagne bottle. Um, and, and in the first draft, that wasn't the case. It was, it was all about Greta, that section, but it was, it was still in close third person. But what I found was she, as a character, she, she makes some, some pretty despicable decisions and she's kind of a mess and to, I mean, like a big mess. And to, to getting that close third person, it wasn't allowing me to develop enough sympathy and compassion for her and her choices. That, that narrative distance 
didn't allow for it, right? There was still that critical distance where you didn't quite understand what was happening with her. Versus first person really allows you to get into a character's head and kind of unpack them and just open up their brain um, and embody them. And, and she needed that if the reader was gonna spend the rest of the book with her. Yeah, she's really critical that you have to buy into. Right, her. yeah, she's incredibly critical. So I figured out something in Grant's characters if you're reading and you're not sure, am I supposed to like this character or not, is <laughs> if he mentions what books the character reads, it's a tip-off, okay? <laughs> so if a character reads Zola, Sontag, Camus, this is a good character, okay? <laughs> um, if the character just has, like, a book of nudes, it's probably not, not, a, not, it's not, not a good character, <laughs> not right? Good character, right? It's so, 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 Koi and so I had a quick conversation. We, we all, you, you know, these are all readers here, so right. we have this bias, too. Right, right. And so, uh, good people read. Good people read, right? <laughs> uh, right, yes, good right? people like read. That, right? uh, and and, it was, and it, assholes don't read, right? And assholes don't read, <laughs> right. Uh, right, right. You know, it's, I'm going I'm to paraphrase it to, like, take the vulgarity out of it, but there's that famous John Waters quote where it's like, if you go, it's go, go home with someone and they don't have books, don't them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, but it was so funny. Koi just pointed, don't stay for breakfast. Don't anyway. stay for breakfast, right? Yeah. Just get out of there. Um, <laughs> get out of there, you know? I mean, it depends on how nice the apartment is. But, uh, right. I, I was funny when you pointed that out to me the other day. I didn't even realize that I was doing that in my books. Like that, like I was characterizing people by what they read. And like, if they didn't read, then that meant they were not a good character. And so it was, but it's, I was thinking about it and I was like, oh my God. And then in previous novels of mine, I do the exact same thing. And so it's, uh, it's a tell. It's a tell. It's a it really, tell. It really is a tell. Like, what are they reading? You know? So what are you reading now? Oh my gosh, I, 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 that, it's a great question. I just you finished. You got this book of nudes. I, yeah, I just, yeah, in my backpack. And then, and yeah, I just have a book of nudes. Um, you know, Herbert's book of nudes. Um, no, I, um, I just finished a, a really wonderful novel that's actually coming out tomorrow called Marrying the Catch-Ups, uh, which is like a, a funny title. I didn't, does anyone know what Marrying the Catch-Ups means? Does anyone, did anyone ever work as a waiter? Marrying the Catch-Ups is what you do if you like work at a restaurant, if, when you're like putting, you know, if you have like a half empty bottle and you're making a full bottle. It's called Marrying the Catch-Ups. Um, and it's, it, the writer is Jennifer Close. It comes out tomorrow. Um, it's, one, it's a family story about this, res, this family who, that owns three generations of this one family that owns a restaurant in Chicago. Um, and this like, big Irish family. Um, and just kind of follows them in 2017. Um, and it's a really, she's a wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, and this is, I think this is probably her best book. Uh, I mean, I'm ex I just got a rave in the Times. Um, I'm, I'm, you should all read it. It's a wonderful book. <laughs> so, now, it feels like a warm hug, you know? <laughs> and I, like, needed that, and so... I, I had a conversation once with an author who said that while he's working on a book that he won't read because he's worried that that other author is going to creep into his work. Right. It's interesting. When I'm working on a book, I do read, but I read what I read is 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 very specific. And so, for example, when I was writing this Greta section, the one that's in first person, I was reading exclusively fiction that was in first person, because um, I hadn't written first per first person in so long that I had to be kind of reminded of the rules of it and how it works. Because um, obviously, when you're writing in first person, you can't observe everything. You're only in one mind, and so. Um, so I needed to see how it worked. So I just my, my desk was just like covered with novels that were written in the first person. Um, I have a very difficult time to that end. I have a very difficult time reading something that is wildly different than my own work when, when I'm working on something. So for example, when I was working on this book, I couldn't read, I don't know if anyone has read the new Anthony Doerr book, uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is ex exquisite and um, is, you know, this it travels in time and is all over the place and is this huge sprawling epic. I, uh, I couldn't read that because it was just so different than what I was writing. I would get distracted and I'm the sort of person where I like, I like the shiny new thing. And so I would read that book and I'd be like, well, I want to write that book, you know, but I'm not writing that book. And so, so yeah. I, I have to kind of prevent myself from doing that. So when I'm between books is when I just like pack all of that stuff in and just read nonstop. So reading for pleasure occurs when you're between writing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I definitely, look, I love reading, so I kind of always consider reading pleasure, yeah. um, but, but the reading like a wide expanse and across genres and across forms, that, that occurs usually between books. Mm -hmm. You're, one of the 
things that comes out in your books is this family. You know, and there's this, uh, it's called the myth of family. You know, family first, family's the most important thing. They can love my family. Yeah. You know, uh, what is it? The uh, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Right. You know, that's Robert Fry. Right, you know, right. Yeah, they have to take you in. But then right. when the door closes, it gets ugly in it there gets sometimes, really right? Ugly. It can yeah. be really, like, well, that's where all the opera stuff happens yeah. is inside the family, right? I mean, yeah. you know, and you kind of play with that. I do. I, so, so family dysfunction is something that, that I think is universally interesting yeah. uh, because, because enough of us are familiar with it. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm being degenerous. I'm... I, uh, that said, I should say I, 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 have, a, I have a wonderful family, I mean, not without its dysfunction, but um, I have a funny story about that. In a second. But uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, when it comes to family, the, the imperfect ways that we love each other. I think that we, we you know, we, we try and we fail. Love, I think, ultimately ends up disappointing us from time to time, but that doesn't excuse us from the obligation of loving. And so once someone that we love does disappoint us or once we disappoint someone else, how do you bounce back from that, you, right? And so that is one thing that really interests me within families. Um, and then just the, the politics of family, right? The subtle negotiations that take place constantly between siblings, between children and parents, between spouses, um, that interests me as well. Um, you know, how do we reconcile our duty to one another with our own selfish desires? Um, and so a lot of my books ex explore um, that. Yeah. It's funny though, my, my, you know, my, 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 my mother in particular is like, like her greatest fear is that I write about her and <laughs> which, which I haven't, but like manifests itself in that she sees herself in every single one of the mothers that I write. <laughs> And like every single one. And so I did a, a, a profile, a, a, the LA Times ran a profile of me a few weeks ago and the interviewer for that profile, you know, asked me what I was working on next. And I mentioned, oh, it's a book set in the 90s in Laguna Beach. I swear to God, within three minutes of that profile publishing, my phone was ringing and <laughs> my mother, I was my mother and she, she, I picked up the phone and she said, you're doing it, aren't you? You're writing about me. <laughs> That's and and I, 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 I talked her back from the ledge and I was like, no, I'm not. And I'm, I swear to God, I'm not. And I, I, I was like, I'm not, I'm not. I finally got, got her off the phone. And then five minutes later, my father called and he was like, but you're writing about her, aren't you? <laughs> that's that quote, right? Yeah. Yeah. When a writer is born into a family, that's the end of the family. That's the end of the family. <laughs> right, right. And Didion also says writers yeah. are always looking to sell someone out. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so it's funny. She, she sees herself in these, in these characters. When I swear to God, not a single one has been based on her. Well, you know, I think as readers, we, as we learn more about you or authors, we love going back to the work yeah, and and seeing if we can find the author in the work, you know. So Nick Harrison teaches Didion to yeah. NYU <laughs> writing students. So I know. you know, or, and I am always or, teaching Didion to NYU writing students. Or Taylor Mack, an Ivy League graduate yeah. from uh, Laguna, <laughs> who goes to Washington, right? Right, right. And so uh, I think it's funny. It's interesting. I was on a, on a I was on a panel yesterday at the the LA Time or the LA Festival of Books, and uh, this young woman asked a question, which was, you know, how do I how do I prevent readers from, she was working on her first novel, and she said, how do I prevent readers from thinking that this main character is me? And, because it's not, and, and my, my response was, well, you don't. You don't, because first of all, it's out of your control at that point, and also I think that, that readers are gonna project, and rightfully so, are gonna project whatever they wanna project onto a book or onto a character, and I think that that's what makes fiction so fun and so interesting is, um, you can see yourself and others in, in literature. Um, that's why literature makes you feel less alone, right? A good book yeah. makes you feel less alone. And so, um, so if, if you know, people say, I, I, I do pull details from my own life, right? I, I do teach writing at NYU. I teach a lot of Joan Didion. I love Joan Didion. Um, I, I did graduate from an Ivy League school and ended up going to Washington. <laughs> but but those, those sort of surface level resume details is, is, is typically, 
is typically, we've got some music here, Jim, no, <laughs> is, is typically where it stops. Um, but I think that readers are in every right to be able to project whatever they want onto a character. Yeah, you know, I, but it's also interesting, we don't often ask the other question, which, you know, we, we look for the man in the work, mm -hmm. but how about the work in the man? So what I mean is, how have these books, when you write them, changed you? I mean, it, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think to a certain degree, a lot of my work, they, uh, when I'm done, when I'm done, that gave me time to think about this. That's good. Um, <laughs> Jamie, keep it going. Uh, no, I, uh, I uh, you know. Can we see this man out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, um, it's funny, when I'm done with a novel and I, I'm going back to read a draft, you know, they take years and you're able to see in the draft, or I'm able to see in my drafts, kind of what I was working out emotionally at the time mm -hmm. about my own relationship, about my own relationships with my parents, um, about decisions or regrets or, you know, aspirations that I have. They often, without even, without me really even realizing it, end up sort of surfacing within my characters. And so um, it's always, the, 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 the editorial process is always really interesting. For, you know, later on down the line, when you're reading the full draft and it's about to go to press, you're like, wow, yeah, I was like, I was like dealing with some shit. You know, no, I'm, uh, yeah. excuse me. Uh, but yeah. it, you know, you're, it, and so I think in that way, it kind of, it shows me each book represents, to me, I'm able to see kind of where I was at that stage in my life while I was writing the book. So it's not just that you have an ex that you live your life, you have an experience you put in the book. It's actually the process of writing the book absolutely. also changes your life too. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, Hemingway has yeah. this quote where it's like, writing is very easy. You just cut yourself and bleed on the page. <laughs> and yeah. you know, to a certain extent, I mean, it's not like that gruesome or whatever, but. But it's it is like that, right? You throw yourself into these things. Um, it's 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 it, you know, writing fiction is this sort of a, a suspended act of lunacy, because you do it for years, right? And you you're living in this fictional world for years, and so to that end, you kind of have to be a little bit crazy. But but to create that fictional world, you're you're throwing everything that you have into it, and so. Um, and so, yeah, they, they do become these reflections of, you know, where you were at that point in time. Do you, do you feel like it makes you more empathetic? Absolutely. You're listening to conversations. You're, this is all... I, I, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think writing makes one more empathetic. I think reading certainly makes one more empathetic. I think that is the, the, the you know, great power mm -hmm. of, of all literature is that it, it forces you to reckon with other perspectives and to connect with characters in ways that are unexpected. You know, that's when I'm always, when I, 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 you know, I bristle when people talk about unlikable characters because I'm like, well, maybe you just weren't able to extend your empathy far enough. Um, you know, or maybe you saw something of yourself in a character that you don't particularly like. You know, I often find when people call characters unlikable, it says more about the people calling the characters unlikable than it does about the characters. And so... It's an unlikable reviewer. Unlikable reviewer, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I tend to write unlikable characters. Yeah. Though, so. Humor is a big part. It of, is. Of your, uh, and that's something you enjoy bringing to a book and I do yeah. I do it um, I also think it's my way as an just as an individual and this is I'm sure how why it comes up in my writing but as a way of it's humor is a way of coping right you you look at the world and it's like a you know a, a teetering on the edge of the abyss and like if I'm not going to laugh about it I'm going to go mad and so humor for me is a way of uh approaching, I think, difficult topics and difficult questions. Um, and so, so it does pop up in my book. I, I, I never really set out to write a funny book. I think, hmm. that, I think that when humor is forced, when you're trying to be funny, you can't be funny. You know, it just kind of has to happen. And so I often, um, you know, the humor just sort of arises in the various situations that I'm writing or the various characters that I'm writing or dialogue that I'm writing, but I, I, I rarely set, set out to write a funny book. Would, do you, would you like to write a book that uh, makes people laugh but also makes people cry? 
Uh, yeah, I love making people cry. <laughs> I, I, you know, if they yeah. cry, they cry. But I, I think that, look, I, you know, this is a, the, it kind of gets to the question of, I, I often have a problem with, I, I read a lot of bleak literature, right? But I often have a problem with literature that like, like a book that doesn't have a single funny moment in it or doesn't have any sort of playfulness to it because like, that's not the way the world works. Right, the world is yes, bleak and depressing and dark, but it's also really funny sometimes. And so, if I'm trying to capture how my, how I view the world, those two things—that the bleakness and the humor—like co- like are inextricable from each other. Right, they're they're always sort of coexisting. And so, um, that's another reason why I think that humor finds its way into the book is that like like things are really depressing, but also things can be really funny. And so, um, so it, I, I think it's just how I see the world as well. Yeah, yeah. So, do you, um, the next book, you, you don't want to talk about that too much. Maybe. Not too much, not too yeah. much. It's all about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you ever meet Deborah Ginder, you never heard it. You never heard it. <laughs> Uh, location comes up in book as yeah, in board. Yes. And so, so location is really important to me as a writer. Uh, I'm really fascinated by, by setting and the intersection of character and setting and how setting influences character and, you know, and, 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 and vice versa. And so this book is, let's not do that again, is, is as the cover suggests, is set in New York and Paris. It's, it's very much a New York novel, but there's a large, sizable chunk that's set in Paris. My previous novel was set in Greece. The novel before that, The People We Hate at the Wedding, was set at, um, in, the, in the UK, in London and on the, the English countryside. Um, and I, I realized, as I was thinking about my next project, that I had never, I'd never written anything that was set in Laguna Beach. And that surprised me mm-hmm. um, because it's, I, I have intimate knowledge of it, right? I have such a strong emotional associations with the place. So, uh, so I was, I, I'm excited to, to, to write about it and to use it as an excuse to, to go back. Setting's times. so important too because of um, the, the emotions that bring when you return to places as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I was uh, the, the, you know, you, we were talking about this on the phone yeah. that you know, you go to somewhere where you had been like as a child and you think about what your life was then and then what your life is now, right? And I, it's, it's, you think about the, you know, you return there and you think about the person that you were then. Right. And you try to f- like do the math of how you evolved into the person that you are now when you're standing in the same place. And it's a really moving experience. I, I read someone wrote that, that they're, biggest regret for people who didn't have the chance to travel is that they couldn't experience this, right? That yeah. they couldn't go back somewhere where they'd been before because it's that moment that you compare, you really evaluate your life and the directions, <gasps> the different roads that you might have taken. Yeah, I mean, I, I was telling yeah. this to you on the phone. I had this really yeah. profound moment along these lines when I, when I was in, uh, I, when I was 14, I went to school in Greece for, uh, right outside of Athens for three or four months. And... I, well, I was there, I, you know, we went to the Acropolis and et cetera, et cetera. And i um, you know, I was 13, 14. I was just kind of realizing I was gay, but really struggling with it. And I um, went back to Athens when I was researching my last book, which again is, is predominantly set in Greece and had it a few days and before I was going to the islands, had a few days in Athens and went back up to the Acropolis and had that experience where I remembered standing in this, this one spot and I was just, you know, this, at the, at the last time I'd been there, it was this teenager who really didn't know who he was going to be, was trying to reckon with who he was going to be, was, was having a really difficult time with it. And I just burst into tears. Um, this, when I was back at that time, you know, a few years ago, cause I just like, I was like, wow, I, I, I pulled through, I made it, you know? Um, and it was a really, really profound experience. Yeah. Do you, so different locations, have you tried, are you thinking about writing in different times? You said this next one, although we were not going to talk too much about yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, we can, we can, we can, we can, right? right, right yeah. yeah. yeah and, and, so it follows my mother, yeah. if I'm not kidding. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I was uh, talking to someone who they, and they said with plotting that, that they have to set things earlier because cell phones kind of screw up plotting. <laughs> uh, that's funny. I, I don't mind dealing with cell phones too much. I will say that writing this book in the middle of the pandemic was a real brain teaser because, um, 
this book, not the, not the one that I'm currently working on that, that's set in the 90s, but it was, it was, it was crazy because you know, I, 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 the world that I'm describing in this book is like the world that existed before the pandemic, right? And so while you were writing it, or while I was writing it, the, it, it seemed like the world was changing every single day. And so I didn't know if the things that I was describing, the systems and processes that I was describing in this book were even going to exist when the book was published, right? This was in 2020. Yeah. I knew the book was coming out in 2022. And so I tried a, different, a few different approaches. One was, I was like, I, I basically wrote the book. And in the book, there was, you know, they talk about the end of the pandemic which that glad I didn't take that route. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, that didn't really work. And then I tried to really heavily incorporate the pandemic and that didn't work. And so finally I was like, you know, well, this book is just gonna exist in the world that I created it. And, and it's just gonna, I'm not gonna try to engage with it that much um, because I don't think there's any way I'm gonna get this right. And so, um, so that, the, the pandemic proved to be a much, this may be a surprise, but a much bigger problem than cell phones. Um, uh, the 90s thing, I, um, it's interesting. I, I don't know why I'm compelled to write about that time period. I think that I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in writing about kind of my own adolescence or bits of my own adolescence in Laguna Beach and growing up there. Um, I think that this book is, is, is expansive and kind of plays around with plot and all these kind of fun ways and... I wrote it during a very turbulent time, and I think I'm compelled right now to write a story that is, I, this word is gonna sound negative, but I don't mean it negative, but a smaller story, right, that, that doesn't have all these moving parts. Um, you know, with everything going on in the world right now, I kind of want to retreat to a quieter, you know, comparatively quieter time, which, you know, for me was the 90s. Uh, and so, so I think that that is really appealing to me right now. So Grant, you, I mean, when I look at you, you've got two things in a way. You know, one is a writer and the mm -hmm. other is a storyteller. And they coincide mostly, but um, storytelling, now there are so many ways of telling stories. Oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. And are you interested in, in kind of exploring other ways of telling stories besides writing? Like writing in other formats, you mean? Like, or screenplays or... I, I mean, you know, it's interesting, a, a, a book of mine, um, the, the People We Hate at the Wedding has been, is being adapted into a film. They've, they've finished shooting it. It should, be, um, it should be out later this year. And, um, you know, when, when you option a, a book, you, you can attach yourself as the writer, and I, I opted not to. And I'm really glad that I made that decision. Um, first of all, when I, I got this, uh, the first draft of the screenplay, um, the, the, the writers of the screenplay, their names are their sisters, Wendy and Lizzie Molyneux, they're incredibly talented there. Um, and I got the screenplay and I was like, oh, I have no idea how to write one of these. Um, and also I think I would have made the mistake of, of trying to adapt it scene by, like scene for scene, which I don't think is smart because a novel and a film are two totally different forms, right? There are things that work in a novel that don't work in a film and vice versa. And so, um, and the things that I really love about novels, getting into a character's interiority, uh, describing setting, you don't really do that in a screenplay, right? Because you have to, you, you have to like leave a bit, a little bit of room for the director to do their job and a cinematographer to do their job. And so I, um, I, I don't have any interest, which is a long way of saying, I, I don't have any interest in adapting anything of my own. Um, I think writing something original that would be more interesting to me in a different form, like a screenplay or a teleplay or something like that. Um, but right now, I'm still, I'm still like really in love with the novel. You know, that makes mm -hmm. me feel like a you know relic these days. But I just love the form of the novel. You love titles of novels. <laughs> you have a lot of fun with titles. I do, and it's funny. Everyone's like, "You, you're so good at titles." I'm not good at titles. Um, they, I, 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 I hit it out of the ballpark with. I, I got really. I didn't hit it. I got really lucky actually with people we hate at the wedding. Um, and after that, everyone was like, "Great title," and I'm like, "Oh no!" But that was actually. Um, I was. I was telling Jamie the story earlier with the the origin for actually the entire book of people we hate at the wedding is I, I, my husband and I went to a wedding in, in Amagansett um, on Long Island, kind of at the, the tip, you know, it's out in the Hamptons, kind of the tip of Long Island. And when the wedding was over, we were taking the Long Island Railroad home with, with two other friends of ours. And 
I won't say we stole four bottles of wine from the wedding. I'll say we appropriated four bottles of wine from the wedding <laughs> for the long trip home. And we managed to finish, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Long Island Railroad, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give a brief diagram, but we finished the wine between Amagansett and Southampton. And so like, if the Long Island Rail, if the, this is the tip of Long Island and this is New York City where we were going and it's this big, Amagansett to Southampton is this. <laughs> So we were like feeling good and a, my friend kind of like leaned in conspiratorially and was like, guys, all right, people we hated at that wedding, go. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like, you know, I was like, you know, again, a bottle of wine deep. And so I was like, kind of like one eye open. And I it was the, 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 the only smart thing I've ever done as a writer is I like took out my phone and put in the notes section, the people we hated at the wedding title, question mark. Had no idea what the book would be about, um, but woke up the next day with like a blinding headache, looked at the phone, <laughs> saw the title, and started writing it that day. So, and that worked out pretty well. It, it worked out okay. It worked out okay. This so. seems like a movie. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I think it would. It's, I tend to write, um, I love scenes, right? I, 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 I got to study in my MFA with um, the late E.L. Doctorow, who's just, you know, he wrote Ragtime and Billy Batkid and just an absolutely amazing writer and an, and, and an even better teacher. And he described novels as a mix of, of montage and scene. Okay, so montage is like the exposition. In scene, we all know what scenes are. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, very much, perhaps it's to a detriment, a scene-driven writer. I love crafting scenes. I love crafting dialogue. Exposition, I like kind of, I, I'm so bored with backstory. Like, I don't care why a character ended up where they are. Like, I just want to see the character in the scene doing the thing. And so, um, so this book, especially, I think of all of my books as the most scene driven. Um, and I crafted it, you know, I, I, I don't think that, I, I, I very rarely sit, sit down to write a book saying like, I'm writing this to get it adapted. I think you're kind of setting yourself for, up for failure, right? You have to sit down and write a novel. Um, but I was really, I'm, I'm, I was very interested in this book and the, the kind of classic dramatic structure, which is why it has five acts and why the sections are called acts, right? I, I think that that structure is really fun to play with. Mm -hmm. And so, so it does end up, I've, I've, I think, feeling cinematic. Mm -hmm. And so, you I mean, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, right? <laughs> There's like news, it's like I'm not allowed quite to share it yet, it's all right, all right. But, uh, but, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, so how much of a break before uh, you start really getting into the next one? I mean, now you've got this whirlwind tour, you've got to go around. I know, it's, I, I know, I, I really... I'm thinking of the book less, you know. I know, where he's right? just like going through these things over yeah. and over and over again. Uh, it ends up feeling like that. I've gotten really, mm -hmm. really good, though, I will say, at figuring out whatever, whatever, any kind of coffee machine they throw at me in those hotel rooms, I can figure it out. Like they, you know, they're always different and I can always figure them out, uh, which I, I'm really proud. I'm like not a crafty, handy person. So I'm like really proud of myself for that. Um, I, you know, I've just started the new book. I'm usually actually, when I have a book coming out, I'm usually very, very, very deep into the next project, which is a blessing. Um, you're distracted by it, you know, your all of, you know, your 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 new baby is sort of the thing that you're focused on. And so whatever happens with the one that's coming out, you're like, oh, whatever. Um, that was a mistake of mine on this 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 go around, not to be as, you know, as invested in this new project yet. Um, I think if I had been, I probably wouldn't be, you know, staring at the ceiling, writing lines for bad New York Times reviews of me. Uh, but uh, but it's just started. It's just started. I, I maybe about 30 pages into it. Uh, and just kind of like, you know, it, it takes a while to find the voice, to find the rhythm, to find the structure. Um, and then, but that's, to me, that's the fun stuff. That's like the fun period when it's just yours and your editor isn't touching it, your agent isn't touching it. It's just your world that you're creating. That's actually my, my favorite part of the process. You, you know, you, we talked about your starting to write, but even in college, you didn't study writing, no. but you had this writing gig. I did, I right? did. So we, which I, I can't believe you found that stuff. I, I that you, you know, I, I'm, it's like, a little creepy, I, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not creepy at all. But like, I, I can only read it with like one eye open. Um, so I'm so sorry that you did. I, um, at the University of Pennsylvania, there is a, uh, the Daily Pennsylvanian is the newspaper, and then the insert there's a, a weekly insert that's like the arts and culture and, and humor insert in the newspaper called 34th Street. And 
I started working for 34th Street my sophomore year, and and like, the, I I told you this. I was like, I found my tribe. I was like, oh, writers are my tribe, right? These are I loved. I like hung out there all the time in the offices, and and ended up becoming an editor, and edited a bunch of different sections. One of which was food and drink, which is why you read so much about me drinking. Um, and then like, the ego section. Oh yeah, and then they created this section <laughs> called ego, which. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that they just sort of told my co-editor and I, they were like, you guys can just like do whatever you want with it, which meant that it was like a total disaster and there was like no coherent voice to it, but it was really, we had, we had a blast, right? It was sort of like we were just like laughing at ourselves. you're writing with other people in a way, or you're sharing, I mean, it's a really different dynamic than yes. waking up and sitting down at a yes, computer by yourself. Yes, a, a very, very different dynamic, but it was a blast. It was so fun. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like that's when I, I really caught the bug you know, where I was like, oh, this is something I want to make a career out of. Because sol- I think of writing as such a solitary thing. You it know? is. It's like music, you have bands, and you have, but writing... It's a very, not- very solitary gig. Um, it, it, I, you know, it's like my, my, my dog thinks I'm the most boring person alive because he just like watches me from the couch. He's like, oh my God, you're at it again. Um, <laughs> you give up. Uh, but, but it is a very solitary gig. Um, I, you get really, really good at being alone. Uh, which I think helps explain why, you know, there's this question that, that I think novelists in particular are often asked, where it's like, you know, when you're done with a book, do you miss the characters? And, mm. and I do. I do. I mean, it sounds, it, you know, it, it sounds crazy, but I, I really do end up missing the characters because I, you know, these are the, the people that you're spending your days with. Right. These yeah. are the people that you're thinking about, which, again, writing fiction is a suspended act of lunacy because they're they're figments of your imagination. Right. And yet you can hear their voice and see their faces. And you're like, I wonder how I wonder how Nick would react to this. You're actually you're having these, you know, these conversations with yourself. And so you do really end up missing them when you're with your gone when they're gone, because it's just you and them. You quoting them. Yes, <laughs> yes, you know, you know, it's, I, I, or I'll be out with friends and I'll be like, oh, I had a friend who said this really funny thing the other day, and I'm like, oh no, that's actually a character that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> My friends are like, who? who? I'm like, don't worry about it. Oh, I think Aaron's giving me the, uh, the eye. How are we doing? We're about closing up, but we do want to take some Q&A, so. Cool. I, I, I can't say, um, we want... Hi. Um, hi. Um, I really love the scene where Greta <laughs> is p- pumping Nancy for commentary on all the people in Washington. <laughs> and, I, and I was wondering, did you laugh out loud when you were writing that? I did. I did. And my husband thought I was absolutely crazy because he was like in the other room and I was like bursting out laughing and like, 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 like these devious little giggles <laughs> as I was writing. Her, Greta asks her mother to like basically give one sentence answers to all of these people in Washington, ranging from Chuck Schumer to Lindsey Graham to like everyone. And, and she gives these ones like kind of like really like fast rapid fire responses, um, which like was really just my, my way. It was, the whole scene was constructed so I could write mean things about Lindsey Graham. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should have you read that section. I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's true. Um, but um, but I, I, I did, I, I, you know, I, I, I did crack myself up, right? <laughs> if I can say that. <laughs> so. The two main characters are female, and I'm curious as a writer and as an instructor, when you're writing from a female's experience and perspective, is there intent, or are you writing it, and then sometimes do you think, well, she may not have worked that way? Is there a female-male brain in how you're writing about women? It's a good question. Um, I, when I'm writing it, no. I'm, I'm just trying to create this person, right? I will, with the Greta section in particular, um, I... I have my my best friend who's a novelist and, and a woman. Um, I she's like and she's also one of my first readers. Like I, I ask her to read that to say like hey, is there anything that's, that's like off here, right? Is there anything? Because I think that it, that's that when you're writing anyone else's perspective and identity, I think that that's a responsible thing to do. Um, but when I'm first crafting the characters, not really. It's later on I think when I'm kind of 
you know, fine tuning. Do we have any other questions? Back here. I'm just curious, other than your drunken state that got you that wonderful title, <laughs> do you find that you start, I guess, what's that first spark? Is it a character? Oh, Is a it a question. setting? Is it an incident? You know, it's, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, right, it's like, where does inspiration come from, right? Um, and I think for me, it's always a little bit different. For my last novel, the one that was set in Greece, for example, I had never written about Greece is another place that has these, as you know, just from the memory mm -hmm. I was sharing, has these, these, these really profound um, connotations for me. And I, I, I had some really formative experiences there. And so I wanted to write about Greece. And so I kind of, I crafted the story around place. Um, with this book, it was a, um, it, I wanted to write, again, I wanted to write something fun. I was interested in writing something that was like kind of caper-esque, uh, like playing around the genre. I was also really, really interested in a central moral question for this novel, which again, when I was writing it, I was seeing, I was, you know, we all were seeing our democracy, which I think something that we had taken for granted, being threatened from left, right, and center and seeing just how fragile it was. And I was really interested in the question of, how far would I go to protect this thing? How far would anyone go to protect this thing? To what degree would I bend my own morals and ethics in the service of the greater good, which is protecting this thing? And that's a question that this family is faced with at the end of the novel. And, and how they decide to respond to that question is gonna have you know, enormous repercussions for the rest of their lives. And so, so with this, it was that question that I think kind of was the seed for it. Um, but it's, it always changes a little bit, you know? Sometimes it's like four bottles of Sauvignon Blanc on the LIRR, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Inspiration comes in the weirdest places. <laughs> All right, any more questions? All right. Well, I do want to thank uh, Grant and Coy. Thank, thank you all Chris. so much, Jamie. Thanks, thank Grant. you. And thank you, Aaron. This is great. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Coy. Thanks, this is great. This is great.